देख लिया मैंने Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, so today we are going to cover lab three. Uh, so the document is already uploaded. And uh, what we're going to do as usual is um, we are going to go through the lab document and look into the questions one by one and uh, also look into the starter code and try to understand, first of all, how to start thinking about each question. What is the logic behind it? and uh, what are the new information that this lab is testing and how to connect it with the lecture and, uh, and et cetera. So um, as I said, this, this document is already uploaded in Avenue for those who wants to, to start, the, uh, like to open the document uh, in, uh, uh, at, the, at their end, uh, they, they can do so. Um, uh, so let's start. One thing about lab three is, so if, if you look into labs, we have been covering the content we, 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 we discuss in lectures uh, almost in a coherent way. Like uh, we, we took the basics and then we had lab one, arrays and functions, and then we had, uh, and strings to some extent, and then we had uh, lab two. And then in lab three, uh, we discussed the, the, the more advanced topic, including pointers. Uh, but also in today's lecture, we are going to discuss structures and this is the last topic uh, no not the last i mean there are uh, this 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 year i'm 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 going to cover uh, maybe one additional topic or or two that i believe they are important for you guys but usually this was the last topic that i discuss in the c uh, in the c part uh, which is structure right uh, i'm not going to explain in detail in this tutorial what are structures or what is the concept behind them what are the details but i'm going to give you only enough information to understand how the lab operate, uh, operates. And then when we go to the lecture at 12.30, we'll, we'll discuss uh, in more details how structures work in C. Good? Um, yeah, so it's mainly structures and pointers because we already covered pointers. Uh, so putting these together, we will see how we can build something meaningful. And, and maybe the interesting thing about lab three compared to other labs is, as you will see from the document, it doesn't have uh, many questions because usually the other labs were these kind of like small questions, like we have seven, eight, 10 of them, uh, and they are very small code snippet where you test a, a certain feature that you know in your, uh, in your programming uh, from, from the lectures. But in lab three, we will try to build something meaningful. So you will find that there are only two questions and one bonus question, so only three questions. The first one is, similar to previous lab questions, like it's an easy one, you just write a function. But lab two, uh, sorry, question two and question three, question two especially, you will see that you are building something that as if you are putting a database, how to access it, how to do some kind of operations on this database, update some files. Um, and also the new thing about this lab compared to previous labs is that we are dealing with input output files, which so far we didn't discuss at all in, in, in other labs. Uh, so this is also something uh, that is good to learn in any programming language because dealing with input output files, like how to read from a file or how to write into a file is, is something that we usually encounter in any uh, practical example. Good. So let's go through the lab document one by one. As usual, you will follow all the steps you have done in lab zero, lab one, lab two, and the midterm. You will find here the invitation link. So you click the invitation link, you accept it and uh, it will create your repo and then you, you import the project in Eclipse, all, all the steps we know, good. And then as usual, you will find three question uh, files. So I will jump into the, the repo for now, but you will find each question in a separate file and there are some header files that we use as well, good. So the deadline is November 6th, it's two weeks. Let's see what we want to do. Uh, as I said, the first question is a straightforward one. So what you want to do is you take two strings as an input, string one and string two. 
Let me write here. You take these two strings as input. And what you want to do is you want to create a third string, which you are going to return. This is your output from the function that uh, concatenates both strings, right? For example, if you have something like input as hello and then input as wallet, you want to bring something that concatenates both. So you return hello world as an output from your function. Good. So something you see here, and uh, you will find it in the last couple of slides in our pointer uh, last lecture, uh, but we will not touch in, in, in detail in, in the lectures. I will leave it for you to read, which is constant uh, pointers and pointers to constants, right? So can someone imagine or think of why we are passing these input strings as constants here? What do you think? From, from my explanation of how the function operates, I'm passing two input strings. I want to concatenate them and then look into their output. Yeah, I, Mark, correct, Arjun, yeah, yeah, sure. Perfect, thanks, thanks everyone, that's correct, because I don't want to, to modify them. Well, if you write your implementation correctly, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be modifying them anyway, right? But the more we advance in this course, the more I want you to get some of the professional skills in programming, not just writing correct uh, or, or a functionally correct code, but also understand how you can write a neat code, right? So yes, if you implement your function correctly, you wouldn't be modifying them. So maybe you can think of why I would need to pass them as constants if I'm not modifying them anyway. You put this as a guard. Like if, if you write it as a constant and then later you, you implement your function in another day or you pass your function to someone else like a colleague in a project or a teammate in, 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 uh, in, in, in your company, for example, if he tries to modify them inside the function, maybe he's like a, a junior or an intern or whatever, he will not be able to, he will get errors, right? So this is a, so it's an additional guard. Being constraining in programming is a very important skill that can make your code easier to understand. And also uh, you only add the minimal functionality you would like to have, good? Okay, Hassan, yeah, so it seemed that, so we can, so yeah, I guess Hassan here is saying, there is a problem. Oh, actually it was able to, to accept it. That's good. So it seems that from the last couple of days, some of you also face problems uh, accepting lab two. Uh, and it seems that me, this problem also might persist in, in lab three. I would say if you cannot accept it now, that's okay, wait for a day or two. It, it, it seems to be a GitHub issue, I believe, uh, internally, and they should fix it soon. Uh, but we will see by Monday, if this problem persists, please let me know and we will see uh, what we can do uh, for that. Good? Good, thanks. Uh, okay, so this is what we want to do in this function. You pass these two inputs as, uh, these two strings as input parameters and then you concatenate them and then you return the third, uh, like the third string, the output string as an output of this function. So here, just something that might be new for you, I'm returning a pointer from a function, right? Remember we said that pointers are normal variables, which means you can return them from functions. And uh, we said this in the arrays uh, lecture, I, I guess a month ago or two months ago, that you cannot return an array from a function, correct? And back then I told you there is a way, there is a trick to get around this. And this trick is to use pointers because simply you can create an array for, our strings are nothing other than arrays of characters, right? I want to return this array of characters or string from the function, but you cannot return an array from a function. What you can do is you can return a pointer to this string from the function, and then now you have access to this uh, full string or full array, good? Um, okay, so one important thing about this question is you are not allowed to use anything from the string .h uh, a header file, so you are not allowed to use any uh, uh, helper functions from the C library that deal with the strings. If you need anything, for example, getting the string length, because you need to check this in your question to be able to concatenate them, you have to go through all the characters of the first string and then all the characters of the second one, which means you need to know the length of both. In this case, uh, you need to write your own function to get uh, the string uh, length. You cannot use, for example, uh, 
str len from the, the, the C library. Okay. Is there any question about question one? Why aren't there between parameters in the header? Isn't constant char um, asterisk, isn't that one variable and then constant string one another variable? Yeah, that's correct. So you pass two inputs, that's correct. So, so what is, is there a problem in, in the header file or like, I'm not getting what is, what is confusing. How, there are two parameters in that header, right? Correct. Uh, it says, is the first one a, why are there two constants? Because you bath, okay, you want to concatenate two different strings, right? So for example, I take hello as an input and wallet as an input. So these are two different inputs, right? Mm -hmm. And you bath, you, you bath both as, um, as constant characters to the function. So this is one input and this is a second input. And what you want to do is to concatenate them, right? So this is why you need two inputs, right? For example, here when calling this function, I'm passing two different strings, hello and wallet, right? So hello will go to the first one and wallet will go to the second one. Why do you say constant twice before the type and after the type? Oh, I see. Okay, 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 okay. That's okay. That's that's an excellent question. So, I was referring to the last two slides in in the in the last lecture. Uh, so, let's let's let me be briefly discuss briefly discuss this. And and in in the lecture slides, you will you will find detailed explanation of this. So, we have two different things here. We have a, a pointer, and we have a variable that the pointer is pointing to. Here, our pointer is string one, and it's pointing to. Uh, an array of characters here. It's it's character array, right? Character, mm -hmm. correct? So these two different things, any one of them can be constant, correct? So for example, I can say, I want my value itself, like the original variable to be constant, not able to change it, but I want to be able to change the address of my pointer, correct? So you can change this one. Let's, let's use, you can change this one, but not this one, right? Mm -hmm. And in this case, if you want to do so, you will write something like character and then the asterisk for the pointer and then constant and then string one. In this case, you are say you are defining what we call a constant pointer, which means you will not be able to change the address of the pointer. So this, the value of the pointer, once you, once you um, assign it the address of the character, you are not able to change it. But the value itself of the character can be changed, right? Okay. The other alternative is, what if I want, okay, I want my pointer to be a variable where I can change it, the address to point to this character or another character, I don't care. But what I want is this value itself, I don't, I don't want it to be changed. So in this case, what you can write is constant, and then character, and then this, and then a string one. Okay, thank you. In, yeah, in, in this case, what I'm doing is I am, I'm saying the value of the string cannot be changed because it's constant, but the address of the pointer, so this pointer can point to this or can point, I later can change it to point to something else, right? The mm -hmm. third alternative is to make both constant. You don't want to change the address of the pointer and also you don't want to change the value that the string is, uh, like the value of the string that the pointer is pointing to. And this is what we do here, right? So the pointer itself is constant, so it cannot point to something else. And also the value of the string is constant, so it cannot be changed. Right? Okay. Yeah, that makes Is sense. Is that clear? Thank okay, you. thanks. Good. So let me see if there are other uh, other questions. Constant character is a point. Yeah, the, the whole the whole parameter is a pointer to a to a character, right? Uh, it says we cannot use anything from the sound library except for Sterling. Except, let me see. Uh, yeah, okay, so if you want to, so so string length, so don't use anything other than string length, but 
I would also implement string length is, is, is three lines function, right? Which is what we have wrote in, in lectures multiple times. You just do a for loop across all the elements and you check whether your last element was a null or not, right? So I would say, okay, keep it given that I already uh, populated the document. If you, use, if you want to use string length, that's, that's okay. Uh, but I just recommend you can implement it if, if you want, right? So Sagnan, this problem has nothing to do with the submission of, of the lab. It, it's a problem in accepting new assignments. You can submit because submitting is nothing other than pushing into the repo. So it has nothing to do with lab submission at all. Lab two is due today and, and it's similar to all other labs. It's mid, midnight due, right? Uh, during GitHub won't let me push my changes for lab two. Can I directly paste? No, you, you should be able to push. I, I have tried it multiple times today and yesterday. If, if you cannot push, that means you have some problem internally. So there is no problem with GitHub. Um, okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, good. So is, is this question okay? Are you guys good? Mark, I understand why you would want to keep the characters in the string constant, but why would you want to declare the pointer as constant? Also a good question. So the rationale is, as I said, be as constraining as, as much as you can. The reason for this is to guard against unforeseen uh, bugs, right? So why are you passing these two input strings? To concatenate them and return a third one. So the only thing you need to change inside this function is the string that you return. So playing around with the pointer of the input is really not recommended here because you don't need it. And this is the reason why you pass it as a constant to guard against modifying it. Because why I would like to modify the address of this pointer and make it point to something else, right? It's, it's not part of the functionality or the correct functionality of the function, which means it's better to pass it as a constant to make sure it's not going to be changed. Quick question I need to lab, but when will the lecture records and updated on YouTube? Jack, uh, I hope, yeah, I can update them by, by today. I, I guess it's only the last lecture, uh, which was like Wednesday's lecture that is not there, but everything else is there. And okay. hopefully I will be able to upload uh, today's tutorial as well for those who want to start working on the lab. Sorry, Jack, you, you said something? No, I just said thank you, perfect. Oh, you're welcome, yeah, thanks. Uh, Zahan, does lab three already push? I cannot find on GitHub. Lab three, Zauhan, you, you need to accept the invitation, correct? So there is a link here. So you, the way we do the labs is I, I first submit this document on Avenue, you get the link, you click the link, you accept the invitation, and then it will be created, right? Okay, good. So the first question is an easy one, not a big deal. Uh, let's look into the interesting part, right? Question two. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to lose power. So if you give me a minute, I will stop uh, the video for a minute and, and just grab my, uh, my charger. Okay. Sorry, guys, G give me a minute and I'll come back. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Uh, I guess we should be good now. Let me see, no, no, submit the lab without accepting the assignment. There is no way to submit the lab without accepting the assignment. Uh, uh, 
uh, Sagnan, that if you had, if you didn't accept lab two until yesterday, that's a problem. And um, what I have done is I, I uh, first of all, I would advise that you shouldn't have waited for three weeks to accept the, the lab, even if you want to work on it later. But anyway, for those who are encountering problems with accepting lab two, what you can do is I sent already the lab starter on Avenue announcement. You download it, you develop your code, and then uh, you can send it to me by TA or send it to the master uh, TA, which is Salah by email. But you only do this if you still encountering problems with accepting the assignment, right? So Nicole, yeah, that's correct. There is no way behind GitHub. And, and this, excuse me, and this is one reason why you shouldn't be waiting for the last minute to accept the assignment, guys, right? I know I know you might have been busy with midterms, et cetera, but those kind of unforeseen problems, uh, they arise in the last minute, right? For lab three, Jumbo, I, say, I would say it seems to be an internal problem in GitHub itself. For lab three, we still have time, so I would say wait try tomorrow, try today night, and then maybe until Monday, if it didn't work, I will, I will try to see what's going on, right? So for some of you, that, that this happened previously in lab two and lab one. If you click the link and it doesn't take you directly to the assignment and there is a problem, I would advise first to try to copy and paste the link into your browser, right? Or try another browser, because sometimes this works, right? Okay, good. So yeah, let's, let's continue. What we were doing, I'm just opening the other machine to make sure I can also share the repo with you. Good, so what we want to do in, in, uh, in question two, good? So we want to build something like a database for students in a class, right? So what you want to do is write a program that manages grades of students. And the way we would do it is we would have the, the student information in a text file and inside our program, to build such database, we want to use something that we call structures, right? As I said, we will cover structures in detail, uh, in details today in the lecture, but the only thing you need to understand is a structure is nothing other than a data type. Oh. Is a data type you define yourself and it can include multiple elements. For example, I can define a data type called student, which is required in this question. And inside this student data type that I define myself, you would have multiple variables. The first one is an int, which represents the student ID number. The second one is an array that's doing the first name, last name, and then uh, and there are, assume there are two projects in this course, the project one grade and the project two grade. And then the last thing is a, a, a floating point double variable that holds the, the final average grade of two projects, good. If we go to the starter code of the assignment, let me see here. I would say I would keep here, then see if I can open that. Oh, by the way, I have pushed all the, um, the answers for the midterm to your own repo. So if you can do a git poll, in your rebel, you will find my model answers for all the three questions and, and the main as well, okay? Okay, so I'm just opening the rebel to show you what I mean by, by that. Okay, I'll switch screen now. Uh, I got uh, a power issue and the other machine just shut down. So hopefully this one doesn't shut down as well. So let me share this with you. So this is, I hope you can see, you can see GitHub now, correct? Please correct me if, if, if this is not the case. So, so here, this is a starter code for the lab. You will find that these are the three uh, questions that we have question one is the one that we discussed. Two is the one that we are discussing right now. Three is the bonus one. This is the header file as usual. And 
let's jump directly into this student.h. So I have another here file where here we define a structure. This is your own definition of type. So you use a word, a reserved word in C called type def. We'll go through this again in detail in the lecture. And then you can you complete here all the elements we are discussing in the lab document, right? So here you would add all, I would guess I have to keep switching. So here you would have these six elements. So you would have an int for the ID, the first name, last name, and then the two project grades, and then the final grade. Good. And then afterwards, by defining this structure, you can really create, now this is a type. So you can think of this as just a normal int now. It's just a purely uh, regular type where you can define an array of it. So the way we, deal, we, we build our database is we build a list of students. So once you define the structure of a single student, you can have multiples of these, which construct the full number of students in the class, right? So how to do this? The first function you are required to write is called create class list. What you would do is you would take as an input a file name and the number of students you would need, right? In, in, in the, the number of students in, in, the, in the class. And then uh, from this file name, you are going to read line by line, as we will discuss right now, line by line, read the student information and create an object or a variable from this structure you created previously here, which is a student one, and dump all the information from the file into the structure. Oh, the, the, it seems very complex. So, so let's jump back again and see. Uh, it, it's not really as complex as it seems, right? So for example, here, I have students do text file. Going inside this file, I have here the first line as the, num the total number of students, right? Which is five which means you should expect next five lines. Each one of them is representing a student. The first element is the student ID. The second element is the fir student first name and then the student last name. Good. And then after reading this file, we will see now how to read files. For each line, which represents a student, you are required to put this student into the list that you created. Right, which is simply just an array that you can create using malloc, right? So here, going back to question two, this is the function that you are required to complete. It basically takes, in this case, students.txt input file, and it takes this as would be the size uh, of, of, of the, or the number of students you would have, and you would write down something or a piece of code that reads from the file, each line would create a student. So now I keep saying reading from file, reading from file, we never encountered this. So let me uh, show you how we deal with input output files, right? So I hope now you are able to see the other thing. I keep hoping, sorry for that, but the other machine just died now. So. Okay, so so I will I will answer I answer the the questions once I just finish this piece of the first function and then we will go through together what questions you guys have. So what I want to do simply, we have seen multiple times before printf and scanf, which is reading something from the screen, writing something into the screen. Like printf is writing, scanf is reading. Good, but most of the actual or or I would say industry level programs are not dealing with the screen. I mean, you're not expecting a user to input something on the screen and how much you can input. If you have uh, megabytes of data, you cannot just keep entering them on the fly, right? So usually you would have your, what we can call a database or input file on the desk, and then your program should input the, even the should open the file, read it, and then construct the database from that file. So we need two things, similar to what we have seen in printf scanf, we want to read from a file, right into a file. But before this, we need to open the file. So we, you have, we have three main steps. The first one is opening the file. The second one is either reading or writing into it. The last step is you have to close the file after finishing dealing with it. Why I would have to do this? Because once you open the file, the file get transferred into the memory. So the data is copied from the disk into your own memory. So if you don't close it, you are wasting memory. It's similar to freeing 
memory you allocated using malloc. So once you do an if open to open a file, you have to close it as we will see right now. So the first step, opening a file, just you can use a very simple function, it's if open, you pass to this function the file name and the type of the operation you want in the file. In C, you can either read or write into a file. So if you open it for read only, that means you are not able to modify it. So you are only reading the file. In our case, for example, we are opening the students.txt file to read the data for the students, which means we are, by no mean we should modify this file. So we are opening it for read, good. Then what does this function return? It returns a pointer or an index of like the, this file. So this is what you can take later and deal with the file in your program, good. Then once you, and we'll see this right now, once you open the file, you can now use a different version of scanf and printf. It's called fscanf for a file scanf or fbrintf for a file printf to read from the file or write into it, good. One example would be once just I had my input file here, which is the, the index of, of the file I opened, you can pass to the fscanf, the input file parameter or the pointer, and then you deal with, with it as if it's a normal scanf. What, what, what is the specifier of the variable you want to read and what is the name of the variable? So it's a very normal scanf, except that it needs a parameter, an additional parameter at the beginning, which is the file, uh, the pointer to the file. Good. And then uh, we will see printf when you want to write. But basically after you read, you read from the file, the last thing is you have to close it. Good. If scanf and if uh, printf both are also similar to scanf and printf are in the studio.h. So once you include studio.h, you will be able to use them. Good. So we have seen reading, what about writing? Again, you would need to open the file, but now you open it for writing, it's w instead of r, and then you use printf for this. Again, it's the normal printf, except that you pass the file name at the beginning. And then at the end, you would close it. Is there any question here? I will show you here uh, some example from the lab, uh, but, uh, but do you have any question about reading or writing into file, like in, in these couple of slides? Can you post these documents on the website? Sure, I have already posted them in, uh, under the lab three uh, on Avenue, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. If this like class in Python, I guess this is a question related to structure, Sarah. That's exactly the case. C is not an object-oriented programming language, but it only has the support for structure. So it does not support classes because it's not OOB language. The, the last thing, like the most advanced thing it supports is just this structure. You can think of a structure as a symbol and an old representation of classes, right? That's correct. And we will see this once, once we see it, we discuss it in details. Abigail, are the IDs, I guess I will come into this, Abigail, once I go back to the lab document, where's the file stored? Originally, the file is stored in, in your desk and you read from it. Once you open it, it, if it's read only, and this is one reason why read only is, might be faster. If it's read only, then it goes to, uh, let me think. I guess in both cases, it should be in the stack because it's only related to this function. You cannot access this file outside the function. So it's not necessarily be in the heap, but I need to check this, uh, Gutung. But I believe it should be in the stack because it's a local to a function, right? What is the difference between class and structure? Nicole, we will discuss this in detail when we come to the, um, to the, to the lecture. Okay, so, but it seems, it seems easy dealing with files, right? Something that is new, but we already know printf and scanf. So once you open the file, you can deal with it as a normal printf and scanf. Good. So understanding this, let's see an example from the lab. So if I go to the test cases dot C, where I, where we write our own tests, let's see. Oh, this is oh come on. Okay, that's not okay. Good, that's not the correct uh, starter code. I just open an old one. So let me see. Repositories. Then lab three should be this one. Okay, so let's see here. You guys are able to see, I guess, right? 
So let's see in question two where I deal with files. Here, for example, this is uh, one of the functions you need to write. I will, I will explain it in detail hopefully soon, but let's just take the part where I'm inputting some file and reading from it. So basically this function is you, you calculate some of the final grade and you output this final grade in an output file. What we do here in this test is I provide um, what we call a golden output. So we, we have what, what output we would expect given the two inputs we pass. This is something that is important also to discuss. So in this function, I take uh, two inputs, two files, the students and the grades. The students only, the one that I just showed you, only have the name, first name, last name, and the ID. While the grades file has the actual grades of the student, it has the ID and the grade for the project one and then the grade for project two. These are two inputs to the, this uh, calculating final grade function. And then inside the function, you read this, you, you read the two grades, you calculate the final one as the average, and then you output a third file, which is here I call output grades, right? So the way this uh, final course grades uh, function works is you pass to it a file that it is going to write into it the final grade. The way I, we test it, is we open this file after the function writes into it. Hopefully that makes it bigger now. And then, sorry if there is a noise in the background. Uh, I guess today is a lucky day as well. And then also I open what you find as a golden output file. So what is output we expect based on the two inputs we passed. And then I compare these files one by one. So let's see how I open this. So first of all, I define the file name here. And then here I use if open for reading. So it's if open the file, this is the pointer to the file name, which is here also the array name. And then I'm opening it for read. And what I do, I check if the file is null, which means I cannot find the file. Then you create an output, you cannot open it. But if it's not null, that means there is something, right? And then for reading from the file, I do if scan if the first one is, uh, is just here this actual pointer that you take the output of the if open into. So this is the index of, uh, of, of the pointer to the file. And then later, this is a normal scan f. So you pass a specifier and you take the value into a variable. Good. And you, I do the same thing for the other file and then I compare both here. Good. Is there any question related to dealing with files, opening them, reading from them? Katie, how does the scanf know what line to pick up? That's an excellent question. So this happens in the background with this pointer. This pointer starts from the beginning of the file. And then every time you read, for example, if I'm reading an int, it reads a full int and it stops at uh, the space and the pointer moves, right? So you don't have to handle this yourself. This is one of the easy things in C that is handled for you. Just by reading something from the F scan F, this actual pointer is already advanced by the amount you have read, amount of characters or digits you have read. Next time you read, it will start reading from where you stopped and it will keep moving forward until it reaches the end of the file. So something you can see here is later, I'm checking if I reach the end of the file, that means the actual pointer will be null, right? This is a way to check whether you reach the end or not. Yeah, I guess also this ans uh, answers your question, uh, Pedjols, this is your, your user ID. So it represents the index of mo moving in the file. Where are you currently in the file? Which character or which digit? Arjun, the only checks the first entry right. Since it's not a loop, it won't read the full file. You will keep reading. If you do this inside a loop, you will keep reading until the file becomes null. Or here, because we know how many students we would have, you will see here, we have a for loop where, do you guys hear the sound? It's like, it's, it's pretty noisy, but I hope the noise cancellation works. So, um, okay, good. So here we'll find that we have a for loop because we know the number of students so we'll go through those line by line. So this is what tells us how many students we would have. But generally, another way of doing it 
which I'm commenting here, is check whether your pointer or index is null or not. If it's null, you have reached the end of file. If not, then you are done. In fact, there are multiple ways of dealing with files in, in, uh, in C, uh, but uh, this is one of the easiest, right? Okay, good. So now we deal with, we have discussed input output files. I guess we should go back to discuss the remaining functions. So yeah, what create class list does is it, it takes the students, like the actual information of the students, like the one that I have showed you, and then it creates the list by the list of, 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 uh, of structures one by one to include this data, right? And you have to use malloc or calloc for that, right? Good. And then the second function is, once you do this, there is, there is a, let's bracket here. Once you do this, another function you would write is now you created already this database using structures and arrays or dynamic memory allocation, right? I want to be able to search it, to delete a student because he dropped, for example, add a student if he comes into the class later uh, or enrolled later, this kind of thing. Calculate some grades after the midterm, right? So the first function you would write is to find a certain student, right? How to find a student in my list? You need to pass the student ID and you would also pass the student list to your, to your function, the one that you are going to read. And this size is the number of students, right? That you would have. And then you keep searching the list element by element, check the ID, whether it's equal or not. If it's equal, then you return you return the student information. I guess end here would return one if found, zero if not found, right? If the such a student is not found, it's negative one. And then let's see, you may assume it's larger than or equal to zero function find, determine if there is student list, return its position in the list. Yeah, so the index. So what is, for example, if this is the third student in the list, the fourth student is like the order of the student in your, in your sorted list, right? The third function is you need to input the grades for the student one by one. And the way you would do it is you, you need the other file, which is grades. So let's open this grades file. I would jump back here. I would look into the grades. This is the file you pass. So as you can see here, it has three columns. The first one is the ID. The second one is the, the first project grade, the second one, the third one is the second project grade. And by doing this, so let's jump back here, by reading grades as an input and passing the student list, what you would do, can, can someone kind of think of what might be the logic that I want to do? So now you have this grade information, you have your list that doesn't have any grades, right? Because originally it only included the ID and the first name and last name. What you would do to, to be able to update your list to include the grades? Can someone imagine, it's, it's very easy logic. I, I, would, I would come into answering those questions, uh, but, but let's think of what we want to do right now. So I want to end with these grades. I have a file that includes the grades, ID, grade one, grade two. I have my list that only have the name, first name, last name, and then the ID. And I want to add the grades. So what, what, what I would do, map student ID to grade. Correct. But how to do this? So simply you read from the file, one ID at a time, and then you search for this ID. Really what you can do is you use your find function here to find the specific ID, right? If you found this ID, what you would do is you would update grade one and grade two uh, elements of the structure. Right, because remember the structure has here the grade, the grade of the first project and the grade of the second project. These are the two items that you need to update from the file. Good. And and you need this size for your for loop because you you would keep to continue doing this until you finish the students in your list. Good. Okay. Is there any question? Let me take questions. What if I have two pointers going to the same file? That's not a wise implementation, Yanhao. You shouldn't be doing this because now 
uh, first of all, I believe sometimes it's, it will depend in the OS, but sometimes you will not be allowed to open the same file for writing, especially by two different applications. But I would guess for, for, for most of the cases, it will go through, but it will create a mess, especially if you are writing. So you shouldn't be doing this. Nicole, where do we create the golden output for our own, own test cases? So the way I have done this, Nicole, and the way you should do it is you will find here a sample. I guess this might require me to jump into here. So here you will find a sample of students.txt file and grades.txt file, which are the two sample inputs. And then the output is created based on these two inputs. What you can do is to create another version of students.txt that includes different information, more students, different student names, IDs, whatever. And they also have different grades. And based on this, simply the output is just taking the first grade, second grade, average them. So it's a very easy math that you can do by hand. And I have created the golden output based on that, right? So you create it manually by yourself. For example, if you have 10 students, just pass this into Excel with some random grades, average them, take the average in your output file, right? Do we create these text files in GitHub or in Eclipse? Uh, you, you can create them in your, so I would say not, no, don't, don't do this in GitHub. I would create them in, in Eclipse or in my local machine. Both are fine. And then you can push them into GitHub, right? Okay. Yeah. Will you show us how to create a text file instead of like a regular Yeah, it's, it's just simply in Eclipse, you can say new file and it can be a text file or even in your local machine in the folder where you have your project, you can simply create a text file. And then refresh your Eclipse, it will reflect in your Eclipse project, right? This might be the easier way of doing it. Okay, thank you. Okay. How do we go about making those new files? Yeah, this is, I guess, uh, what Nicole was just asking. Uh, maps, Boxy, I have a problem when accepting the lab three. Okay, I guess we have already discussed this, Boxy. So wait until Monday and we'll see if the still problem persists. Something you can do is just copy the link into the browser and see if this works instead of just clicking the link. Good, so going back to here, we don't have too much time, but uh, okay, we, we discussed input grades. We briefly touched on compute the final grade and I just discussed this right now. The way it works is now we don't need any input files, right? Uh, you just compute the final grade based on grade one and grade two that you have already computed from input grades. And then you update the final grade uh, element in your structure, which is the last one here, right? So compute final grade is going to update this based on the average of these two, right? So it's a, a simple, simple math function, but you, again, you have to loop across all the your students. This is why you need the size of the list. And then after cal computing it or calculating the final grade, you would output this in a file. Uh, and in this case, you take this file as an input by name. So in, in our example that I showed you in GitHub test cases to see, I have passed output, I guess I called it output grades or something like this, which is the file that you are going to open for writing and dump those final grades into. And uh, the last function is just, what if a student withdraws from your course, you have to remove him or delete him. So you take again, it's similar to find, but with one extra step for find, I take also exactly, if you go here, all the same number of parameters, it's, it's almost very similar prototype, but here you only find the student and return his index. What you would need to do in the withdraw is to delete this student from the list. And because this is a sorted list, you have to update your list. So by removing the student, you need to kind of work around your, um, your, uh, because you would have like an empty position in, in the middle and you have to shift everyone afterwards into that one. Finally, at the end, after you are done with your program, you need to destroy list. Why I would need to destroy list? Because what we discussed in last lecture and the lecture before, if you allocate memory using malloc and clock, simply you have to free them. So here, when we say destroy, you need just to free your memory, right? This is the free bar. Okay, so I guess I, by this, we have almost touched on everything. Maybe the last thing I want to show you is uh, we, we are done by time, but let's quickly discuss the bonus question. 
this question is not part of the lab grades, it's just a bonus mark. It's an extra 1% bonus mark. Uh, it's again dealing with input output files, but just read words and source them. So simply what you would do, if you implemented question two, in fact, question three will be pretty easy because what you would do is again, you will read from an input file, this one here, and then uh, I guess like back to Nicole's question at the, at the beginning of, of, of the tutorial, here we only have a single constant, which means our uh, string itself is a constant, but the pointer itself is not a constant. Good. Why I would do this, why I don't want the, the pointer to be a constant? Because later I, I, this pointer will move in the file, right? So I want it to change, right? That's why I'm only using the file name because I don't want to change the file name. Uh, oh, sorry, this is a file. Yeah, that's correct. You don't want the pointer to change, but the, you, 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 can, you can have the pointer changing, but the file name itself wouldn't change. And again, also, I guess this would be the size. Let me read this. This would be the size of the words you would have in your file. So let me see, in order of integer values of the characters to read the data from the file your program invokes this. String, this is a function has to store words in an array of strength, the memory again has to store the number of words, correct. So end pointer is the number of words. Good. So simply you would have a file called words or called whatever. It has number of words. You have to read them, create a list for these. This list now doesn't use structures at all because just a simple single variable. It, it's not a student that has multiple elements. And then two things you need to do. You need to sort these words alphabetically using two different sorting algorithms. What is a sorting algorithm? There are different ways of sorting a certain array, right? And I guess we discussed this before when we did an array sort in one of the lectures. One of them is, for example, just take every element, see if there is a bigger one and then swap these ones, right? Another way is, for example, called binary sort where you divide your array into two halves, try to sort these, but also two halves and then sort them. So I, I would leave this as, as kind of an open question. One of the main purpose of this post bonus question is to expose you to some of the sorting algorithms. What you want to, if you want to sort something, what is an efficient way of sorting, right? So these two functions do exactly the same thing, but with a different algorithm. So if you implement a certain algorithm here, you would, you would want to change your method in the, in the second one, right? So lastly, before I stop, I want to show you this in the starter code. So here you would find the word list to text. This is an example of an input you can have. At the beginning, again, you have the number of words, and then here you have them as word by word, good? And then you would have to read this in your here. You would have to read this and create your word list and, and return it at the end from the read words function. And then this is the first sorting and this is the second sort. I have also added here two helper functions for you to implement or to use, because if you want to sort, you need to compare two strings and you need to swap them, right? So you can implement these two functions to help you implementing the sort, right? Let's see how do we test that, because this also will kind of explain to you how they work, right? In question three here, for example, I take the word list to text as an input, and then I pass this, this is the input file, I pass it to the read words function that you implement in question three to see, and then it creates the actual list, right? Now, given that I know the input file, I would also know the expected list, which is going to be this one, and then I compare the lists one by one, good? To make sure whether they are correct or not. This is just for reading the list or creating it. Now, what about sorting? The way you would sort is, again, I would read it, I would create the list using read word, and then I would call one of my sorting functions, which is sort to two in this case, for example, and then I would sort the list myself alphabetically, right? Apple, banana, whatever, and then I would compare them after sorting them, right? One way also for testing, which is very interesting, now you do two different algorithms. So one way to write another test, because remember in lab three, similar to any other lab, you would implement your own uh, testing, test cases for each function, right? One way to test the sorting algorithms is really to call one, call the second one, and then compare both. Because if both are, I mean, there is a case that both can be wrong, 
but hopefully at least this is one, one way to test if you have one of them correct, the other one is wrong, then the, the, the test case will fail, right? Good, by this I believe I, I just quickly went through lab three, I mean, given the, the, the time we have, uh, I'm done because we are already over by five minutes. I, if anyone wants, wants to leave, I mean, you, you are more than welcome to do so. I will just remain for a few minutes to take the questions. Um, Okay, Danny, Katie, yeah, this will assume that all words start with a different letter, not necessarily Katie, because they can start with the same, with the same first letter, then you have to check the second, right? So sorting alphabetically is you start from the first letter, if it's AA, for example, you check the second, et cetera, et cetera. You have to check, it has to be really sorted as like a dictionary sort, right? Nicole, is the 1% of the lab grade or one on the course grade? It's 1% of the, um, no, not not one percent of, of, of the course of sorry, not one percent of the lab grades, one percent of the course grade, right? So one out of, of hundred. So uh, uh, for this, would you assume that all will start with a different yeah, okay. Uh, Danny for lab two question two, it asks twice to test the function. Is that a typo? Yeah, it, it might be a typo. I mean, if you write a test for your function, that's okay. I guess it's very similar to all other labs. So if, if you feel something inconsistent with this, just ignore it. No, you don't have to test F apps. Uh, Joran, for my bushing for lab two, I was able to bush a week ago and even a couple of days ago, but just not past few days. I kept trying to bush multiple times over and over, but it keeps saying rejected if the issue persists. So Joran, if you have a problem with bushing, I would say, please, I mean, we already have office hours running right now. There is no way, there is no problem with GitHub Bush at all. And I wouldn't expect that there would be a problem with GitHub Bush at any time because millions are using that. And I was able to push yesterday. You guys were able to push in the midterm. I was able to push today morning, creating this starter code. So there, there is no problem with this. So what I'm expecting is you might have uh, either a conflict because you tried to update your repo on the browser or there might be something you are in a different file. So I would say just go to office hours and one of the TAs will help you, right? As a last resort, okay, you can just copy and paste in your GitHub as, as you just said, but I really recommend against this because now you will create conflicts between your browser and your local repo. But if you have no other option and then you have, it's like 11.55, then I would do that. Second, to clarify, if I'm unable to accept the assignment, then I can send the lab, I finish directly to your TA. So, if this is about lab two, then that's correct. Uh, if you're not able to accept it, but I would say Sagna is too late to accept it today or yesterday. But anyway, yes, send it to Salah like that master TA. And then we will, we will try to correct that. Maybe because of lag in the new file, you just explain still not on my avenue. Sorry, Zawhan, I'm not sure which new file. Are you talking about lab three? document or the dealing with input output files. I'm not sure of that. Um, not a document, just um, you just explain what is the first question and you talk about how to, yeah, it's another word file. There is no word for, I'm not, yeah. So the lab document itself is on Avenue, but if you are referring to the one that I use for the explanation, yeah, explanation. So, are you referring to this one? Is Sorry, it this one? one? Like the one I'm sharing right now? No, not this one. Is it this one? Let me see. Is it this one? Like the input output one? Yeah, this one. This one should be in, I, I have just uploaded it. I would check again, okay? But it should be also under okay. left three. Because of a lacking. Okay, I, I, I will check, okay. Uh, thanks, sorry. And also cannot find, and also cannot find the lab three on my GitHub. Actually, I already accepted. Um, maybe also because of um, lagging on the line and the GitHub will give some time to. Uh, yeah, it might be. Maybe you need to refresh your page. Yeah. But again, may, maybe also because of the GitHub issue. I'm not sure of that. Yeah, yeah. I refreshed many times. Okay, okay. I, I, I okay. would need to Maybe. check this. Yeah. I'll stop. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Yeah, let's wait until Monday and I will see what we can do.
Okay. Um, Thank I you. can't see you later. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dylan. I Was there a question? A, yeah. yeah, I just want to ask a question about the lab too. Like we are having the problem accepting those lab and you send the uh, start code to us. I'm just wondering, can I just um, create uh, one new report by myself on yeah. my GitHub? And then can I just import those files into my report and then invite yeah. you as the fin finish lab as Okay. One of the yeah. That's that's one. Yeah, I really appreciate this suggestion. The would only that thing you working. Sorry, hmm? sorry to interrupt you, but uh, yeah, this would be yeah. an excellent idea. It's better than sending it by email with only one condition, which is please make this repo as private, not public, because otherwise. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. I, I I did for that. Okay. Like, yeah, I, I I'm just following, like I'm I'm, I'm literally just doing all the setting as you do as other previous lab. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, this, this would be excellent. I just don't, didn't want to ask others to do this because they might find it complex to create a table from scratch and import files into it. But if you're able to do this, it's much better than sending code by email. If I do it this way, do I still need to send my code to those? The, the, no, maybe just as a double check, send an email to Salah and maybe even me with the link to the repo, okay. just to make sure if we didn't receive the invitation, at least we know you have done so and we'll try to access the repo, right? Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I guess Sarah had a question about lab two, question seven. Let me see, where did I stop? Uh, so Sarah, are you still around? Okay, good. So let me, I don't remember, to be honest, what is question? Oh, now I remember question seven is the one that you are, you are getting this sparse representation and compact representation of vectors. So, so in question seven, you are asked to do the following. Question six, you take a sparse vector, which has multiple zeros, and you represent it in a compact way using two different vectors, right? Like the one that has the value and the index. So if you are done with question six, this is perfect because six is harder than seven. Now let's think about seven. In seven, you are required to take two vectors as an input, but you take them in the representation of this compact representation, which means each vector has, in fact, two different vectors, the value and the index, and you're required to add them, right? And return a third vector also in the compact representation. So this is only what you want to do in lab and in question seven. The only condition is you're not allowed to use functions from six. For example, you're not allowed to take the compact representation, put it back in the sparse representation as a normal vector, add the vectors, and then transform it back. So this transformation is not allowed. Then how you would add them. So uh, I, I would also refer you to the video tutorial of lab two, which I guess was two or three weeks ago, because I explain it in detail using the bin. But simply, you can do the following. So let me see if I can, if I can just write something quick here. I guess you are able to see my, my screen, correct? So the point is, oh, how to line. You have the first vector as someone that is giving you a certain value on three, five, six, and then this is in position two, this is in position four, this is in position seven, for example. And then a second vector that has the values of, let's say one, two, three, and this one is in position zero. This is one in position seven and this one in position, why it stopped writing? Seven and then this one in position 10. So what you want to do is you want to go, for example, go through your first vector one by one. You would check the position here, this is two. And then you go to the other vector. If there is any, any element that has the index of two, that means now you need to add, now I'm, I'm, I'm looking into my output. So this is input one. This is input two and this is the output. So in the output, I want to also create the graph in the same representation. So two, is there anything here with index two? No, which means this vector at index two, it had zero, right? Which what I would do is in two, I would just copy the three because it's three plus zero is still three. 
And then the problem is if I started with two, I, I would be missing the zero here, right? So what you want to start with is you start from the element zero into the maximum element and you would go one by one. Zero, there is an element here, but no element here, which means here it was at zero, it was a zero value. So it would be one and zero. One, there is no one. So you wouldn't add it into your representation. Two is here, so you'd have two and three. Three is not here, four is not here. This is four. Let's say this is four, okay. So four is here, so you would have four and five because here there is no four. Five is not here, six is not here, seven. Here seven is a different case because seven is here and there, which means you need to add these two. Six plus two gives you eight and this is seven. And then later you would have the only remaining one is 10 and this is three. So the way I would implement this, I would have a for loop that goes from zero into the maximum element I have in both and check each index. I would check both arrays. If the index has a certain element, if then I would add both, if not, I would, if, there is, if it exists on a single vec vector, I would take it. If it doesn't exist at all, I wouldn't put it in my final output. I hope this kind of clarifies a little bit how you go through this. Try to write down an example similar to what I have done and uh, maybe revisit the, the video tutorial that I discussed uh, three weeks ago. I hope this helps. If, if you still have questions, please ask or, or just go to office hours as well and, and we can kind of look into your code, try to help uh, you develop the logic. Yeah, that makes sense. I just have a quick question. Yeah. So we're allowed to assume that input one and input two are the same size. Uh, not necessarily, right? Because these two vectors can have different sizes and different, oh, let me re try to like remember. The, like the sparse vector itself with all the zeros. I, I guess you, you, are, you are given, let me go back to the lab document because I don't want to say something that I don't remember, but I, I would believe you would be given this, let me see. Yeah, you would be given K1, K1 is the number of non-zero elements, K2 is, yeah, so the only thing you need to know is K1 and K2, but the original sparse vector, you, you wouldn't need to assume they are the same size, right? Because the only thing you need to know is the sizes of these two uh, sparse things that I would just discussing right now, right? Like these, these two are the ones that you're going to operate on, which means you need to know their maximum size, right? But other than this, I don't think, I guess maybe because you're asking about the index, how to know the index, right? How to know from zero to which, to which index I would check, correct? Yeah. Then something I would write, I would go through these ones in an initial for loop, find the maximum value. And this is all what you need to do. Because really the last value here is this value here, right? And the number of elements you would have here. Okay, so that's also a good thing. As a safe, would this be enough? Because it can be as uh, like as simple as this one in, in, in worst case, have the size of this one, which is K1 plus K2, right? Because of, if all the elements are not overlapping, then the size of the, of the result would be K plus one plus K2, correct? Mm -hmm. This, this is also something that I guess you can, you can do, uh, but yeah, I guess this is, this is something you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so to be honest, I can write an extra piece of code to determine the optimal size of this one, which is K3 based on how, how much overlap you would have between both, right? Because K3 is less than or equal to that, right? If there is no overlap at all, so it's the sum of both. But if there is overlap, then it will be that minus one. If there is one overlap, minus two, if there is an overlap. So if you write a for loop that goes through these ones from K1 and K2, an instant for loop, and you check how much overlap you would have, you will be able to come up by an optimal value of K3. But aren't you given already K3 as an input? Let me see. Yeah, you're not given K3 as an input, yeah. So, so I would say you can start by assuming it's the submission and then later once you finish the implementation, you can think of how to optimize this if you want, yeah? Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Okay, Danny, Zawan, Sarah, Jorin, okay, thank you, okay, Sagnan. 
Okay, thank you. I'm also able to run the starter code you give us on Avenue Lab 2. Okay, Zagnan, I have already updated it. Okay, that's an important point. Yesterday, if you, if you look into my update to the announcement, you will see what I mean. The, the original starter code I pushed was an old one, in fact. So please check that one, right? I have updated it yesterday night. So please go ahead and check that one. The new one should be able to run. Good? Okay, so if there is no further question, I would, uh, I would conclude for now, and I would guess I would see you in less than one hour. Yeah, thanks um, everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just one further question. Sure. I was, I just quit my own repository, but it doesn't let me to add any contributor, but I can add in the assets to the finish lab, is that okay? You can add the assets? Like I, I manage the uh, assets of my repo. Like I can, I can, I can like invite Finder's Lab to access my code, but it doesn't let me do anything with the contributor stuff. Oh, I see. So it, 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 it only for assessing you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, is but I am not thing? sure if this allows us to clone it, right? I guess that's because the GitHub for Okay, let me think. GitHub for individual repositories, if it's private, it doesn't allow for contributors, if I remember. Is that correct? I'm not sure. Let me I'm check, let me check this, this offline. And I, can, can you send me an email? Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. I'll uh, check and then come back to you. I believe it, there might be a way to add us as a contributor. The only problem with assessing it, we might not be able to clone it, right? Okay. Um, uh, like, how, what is the format to send you an email? Like last time I have sent, yeah, it's, but- Yeah, it should just be comp eng to sh4 as, as in, the, in the topic, because otherwise- Does it, it matter with the square back bracket or round bracket? No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It just comp to sh4, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, talk to you later then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.